So I'm going to begin and I'll just simply say welcome to the 18th in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme supporting businesses in a time of crisis. I'm Will Pino, I'm the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. So the topic of this webinar is investing in your retirement, a post COVID-19 response. And today we are partnering with RBC. The objective of this meeting is to provide businesses and individuals with expert guidance and advice on how to make prudent retirement planning decisions and investments, especially in light of the government's COVID-19 relief measure, which allows for a pension holiday and pension withdrawals. Our presenters and panelists for this session are Paul Brooms, Alexandra, Alexandra Benya, and Gordon Goss, whom I will now formally introduce. Paul Brooms is the branch officer and, and service desk investment advisor for RBC. He has more than 12 years of experience in the industry. Paul demonstrates a clear passion for educating clients on the benefits of investing and helping them to achieve their financial goals. He joined RBC Dominion Securities team in 2014, and today he's primarily responsible for building cost-effective diversified portfolios for clients to begin their investment journeys and providing project and efficiency support to their three branches. He is known among clients for his prompt turnaround time and clarity and transparency around their investments. He's a firm believer in ongoing education has earned advanced industry designations as a chartered financial analyst and a chartered alternative investment analyst. Alexandria has 20 years of proven experience in business administration with RBC. She's in supervision, compliance, risk, and operations of international financial advisory services. She provides a strength of management oversight for RBC um, Dominion Securities Global Limited. She's been with the firm since October 2008, creating a long-standing partnership with the managing director to serve both the office and clients to the best of her capabilities. Her previous roles include senior compliance officer for Latin American region, compliance project project manager for the top four investment banks in the United States. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Boston University, along with an MBA with a concentra concentration in finance from Bentley College Graduate School of Business. In addition, she holds security licenses and professional certifications in FINRA Series 7, 9, 10, and 63, and is CAMS certified. Wow, got through that. Uh, Gordon Goss is an investment advisor for RBC. He has spent the last 12 years of his career with the bank, primarily in Canada, before moving to the Cayman Islands in 2018 with his young family. His formerly education is in economics. And in addition to being an accredited financial planner and a chartered investment manager, he was granted a fellowship of uh, the Canadian Securities Institute for his contribution to Canadian capital markets in his career. He's passionate about finding an edge in the market and providing peace of mind through financial planning process. So I'd like to thank the three professionals from RBC for hosting this webinar for us. And before I turn over to Paul uh, and the RBC team, let me remind you that you may submit your questions during the presentation through the, through the chat feature. There'll also be the usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. You just have to raise your hand and I'll open your mic. And then we'll be taking those, um, your question and answers during this section again. So again, just raise your hand at the end if you ask, uh, want a question to be posed through the mic. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and he's gonna lead us in the presentation. And thanks again to RBC. Thank you very much, Will. Also wanna say thank you to Sharon and the uh, rest of the Chamber of Commerce team for having us on uh, to do this presentation today for you. Um, we think it's a very timely presentation and kind of a theme to do as uh, a lot of uh, pension funds are about to be paid out. And my understanding is the, the funds are about to hit the accounts uh, if they haven't hit this week. By certainly next week, there's going to be quite a bit of funds being dispersed. So we thought it'd be timely um, to kind of uh, give you a sense of how you want to think about those funds. And uh, we want to really talk about investing in your retirement, especially in a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, making your money work for future you. Thank you, Will, for that, um, for that introduction. 
just a little bit of summary of our speakers today. So as just a reminder, um, we have myself, Paul Brooms, branch officer and investment advisor of the service desk. Uh, we'll also have Alex Baina, um, our assistant branch manager, and Gordon Goss, uh, who is one of our investment advisors with Dominion Securities Global Limited here in Cayman Islands. I'm going to turn it over to Alex right now, who's going to give us a brief um, summary about what we do here um, in DS Global. Alex. Thanks, Paul. Um, hi, my name is Alex, and uh, I'm the Assistant Branch Manager at RBCDS. Um, for all of you that don't know who we are, um, RBC Dominion Securities is a full-service brokerage firm based here in the Cayman Islands, um, as well as in Bar we have a branch in Barbados and we have a branch in the Bahamas. Um, we basically provide advisory and discretionary management services to high net worth individuals. Um, we're owned, we're fully owned by RBC Dominion Securities Inc., which is Canada's leading investment and wealth management firm. Um, so essentially, we provide um, our clients, our clients get the benefits of having a Caribbean based relationship with the security of having their assets held. Um, in Canada with RBC Dominion Securities, Inc. Um, we advise and manage on about USD $5.4 billion in assets. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, with COVID-19, and, and I've been working for this firm for a very long time, and uh, I was pretty impressed with the way that um, DS Global and RBC Dominion Securities, Inc., our parent company, manage the situation with COVID-19, you know, that that's really when, you know, the benefits of um, having a parent, like such as a leading, you know, firm like RBC and, you know, one of the best capitalized uh, banks in the world um, supporting you is that you can move quickly in these tough times when you need to, you know, when you need to pivot and, you know, do what you need to do to maintain your business afloat. Um, so really, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic that, you know, pretty much triggered a lockdown, you know, our team was able to transition fully to work from home within like a matter of two or three days, which is just incredible. I mean, it was kind of, it was, it was, it was literally a very seamless process, which was very surprising considering, you know, the technology involved. Um, but literally by the end of, by the end of March, RBC Wealth Management had moved nearly 10,000 employees to work from home while processing over 15 million transactions, totaling over 46 billion, which basically we were, produ we were processing over triple the normal value because of course, you know, lightning hits three times, not, you know, just once. So of course, COVID-19 came along and, and, you know, a pandemic's been triggered and then the markets had the worst rally ever. So, um, so it was very important that we were all up and running to manage, to manage our relationship with our clients, to put our clients at ease and to service and address their concerns um, as soon as possible. So, um, with that, you know, just telling you how fabulous we are. Um, it also, you know, our, you know, we also have um, lots, we've been supporting um, our community. We've been supporting our local communities in Cayman, in Bahamas and in Barbados. We donated over $38,000 to the Cayman Food Bank, the Red Cross Society in Barbados and Hands, and Hands for Hunger in the Bahamas. So um, we're very active in the Cayman community. I'm sure, I don't know if some of you who know our managing director and some of our investment advisors, you would have, you would have seen them trotting their stuff um, in Cayman Bay on uh, the walk on heels. Um, you know, they did better walking on heels, some of them, than I do. So it was pretty interesting. And um, just, we volunteer with Jasmine and we're just, we are very involved in our community and we're very involved in assisting the different, um, the different sponsorships and employee volunteering activities. So um, I think I've done a good job of presenting RBCDS Global. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, Paul, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, yes, we, uh, I must say the Walking Her Shoes event um, it was quite interesting. We did learn a lot about our investment advisors. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, 
Uh, moving on to the National Pensions Amendment Law 2020. Um, you know, when this was announced back in, I believe it was March. Now I, I have a hard time remembering uh, the days, weeks, months. It's all the meshed into one. Um, you know, <laughs> just one day. <laughs> Uh, so the National Pensions Amendment Law was announced back in March, and um, the law is meant to be enforced from the 1st of May to October 31st, 2020. So uh, the pension law had two main, um, you know, components of it that apply to, to most of us. Um, the pension, a pension contribution holiday period from the 1st of April, 2020, and then uh, 30th of September, 2020, meaning that um, you no longer for this period, you no longer were com uh, you no longer were comp um, it was no longer compulsory. Excuse me, uh, to to contribute to your uh, pension here um, for these months, um, but the employers still had the option to contribute on your behalf, um, and any of those contributions that you did choose to pay would have become um, additional voluntary contributions. And the kind of the kicker of the law was the emergency withdrawal provision, which allowed you to withdraw. Um, from your pension, um, if it was under 10,000 10, KYD, you can withdraw up to 100% of your pension. Um, if your pension was above 100,000 or 10,000 KYD, excuse me, um, you could withdraw up to that $10,000 um, and then up to a 25% of the remaining balance of the amount that exceeds $10,000. Um, so, I mean, for me, first of all, that was a uh, kind of an eye opener and it kind of set the stage to understand how big of an issue this COVID-19 um, was, even if even here in Little Cayman or in this Little Cayman Islands compared to the rest of the world where things have been a lot worse, um, that government would take such an extraordinary step uh, to uh, try and help people who by no fault of their own um, saw their economic world basically come to a halt. Um, I think this was a big extraordinary step to try and help people, you know, weather the storm until we were able to get back to some sense of normalcy. So before we kind of get into the meat of our presentation, um, we thought it would be very um, important to kind of give a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, I think the key word in the, um, in the amendment was emergency. And um, I am very much, and we are very much um, in agreement with the Premier's feelings on this that, that he's made um, quite a few times. That this is an emergency um, measure, um, an emergency in the sense that if you if you need these funds to survive day to day, to to you know uh, take care of day to day emergency very um, very pertinent obligations, then by all means um, these if the op the option is open, so by all means make use of the funds. Um, our focus here for this presentation um, is on persons who either now um, have taken out the funds without necessarily needing the funds for day-to-day -day survival and is also future focused for those who, you know, six months from now, eight months from now, 10 months from now, um, you're, in, you're in a fortunate position that you no longer actually need the funds or you didn't have to spend the funds or you didn't have to spend all the funds and now you have these excess funds and you're wondering what to do with them. So we're hoping to kind of give you something else to think about, um, you know, that, uh, that dream purchase that you may have had in mind for quite some time um, that you weren't able to do, uh, you know, these pension funds coming in handy might, uh, might kind of tempt you to go ahead and make that splash. Um, we wanted you to kind of think about this in a different way before you go ahead and make that splash. So um, I'm sure most of you at least once a year or you know, every quarter you get um, this letter in the mail or you get an email in your inbox that says this is your pension statement and these are what's in the statement. You know, this is your beginning balance. This is you know, how much you contributed at the, during the period, your ending balance and or before your ending balance, how much the, uh, your assets increased or decreased and then your ending balance. And uh, once a year, we get to our reports from the pension administrators or administrators or the trustees um, telling us what we're invested in, whether it be a, you know conservative uh, growth, balanced, um, aggressive growth, and what is contained in those uh, in those different portfolios. So uh, I wanted to first start by describing you the basic components 
of an investment portfolio, of a typical investment portfolio. And these components are, are you know, displayed in the range from low risk and low return, expected return, to high risk and higher expected return. So the first component usually that you'll see on your statements is the cash component or the cash equivalents. So these are usually your least uh, volatile and most liquid um, components of your investment portfolio. So by cash being you know, actual you know, physical cash or uh, cash equivalents such as short-term um, treasuries from, from governments, usually the US or, or you know, some uh, very um, investment grade or very high quality um, country um, such as you know, short-term treasury bills and those types of things. Um, now, you know, it's usually volat least, the least volatile asset class um, if you're more likely talking about USD or, or KYD. Um, some of you may be from other countries um, where you have an exchange rate that uh, fluctuates against typically the US dollar. Um, volatil volatility or the amount of movement in your cash balance um, when you're trying to spend those funds on um, something in, in USD or another foreign currency may be a different experience depending on how, um, how your dollar is valued versus um, that, uh, that US dollar. Um, so that's something to keep in mind there. Um, here in Cayman, we're fortunate to, to have a stable currency, so that's usually not a problem for us. Um, cash, you know, other than you know, being kind of a, a way to, to keep volatility down, it can ask, also act as dry powder in the sense that um, you can use you know, excess cash balances to take advantage of opportunities that arise in, in the markets um, as things change, as things evolve. And that could not have been more true uh, back in February and March um, when the COVID-19 um, when COVID-19 situation really began to show. Um, next, you'll have on the risk scale, you have your bonds, or you may also know it as fixed income. Um, so these are you know not as liquid um, and a little bit more volatile than cash, um, but depending on the type of fixed income or bond that you're invested in, um, these tend to be pretty low volatility as well. Um, and also with the commensurate um, lower expectation of returns. Um, these, these really act as uh, the ballast or the anchor of your um, investment portfolio. So typically, you know, you have some portion of your funds, let's say, you know, 20 or 30%. Um, with that proportion, you can expect that um, that, that proportion of your portfolio would not fluctuate in value too much either on the higher end or the lower end. And usually uh, fixed income provides um, a good avenue for producing income. And that becomes more important as you progress later in life, um, getting onto your later stages where income and uh, preserving that um, nest egg that you've built over the years um, becomes really important. And then uh, we also have, then we go into more of the growth assets um, and we have equities, um, alternative investments in real estate, um, which I think real estate, you know, kind of plays a bigger role here in Cayman, just because of how um, how well the real estate market has done over the years. Um, you know, save a few um, episodes in the middle there with our worldwide recessions. Um, so equities um, provide the biggest opportunity for the for an increased growth or increase in value of your portfolio. Um, equities have to play a big role in a portfolio, especially um, early on um, in your kind of work working journey or your investment journey, because we do need that potential for growth um, to come back a couple of forces um, in, in the, um, that, you know, act against the value of the cash and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, depending on the type of stocks that you invest in as well, um, there's also the potential for income uh, through uh, dividends, you know, not all companies, but a lot of companies pay dividends, and you're hopefully hopefully buying companies that um, have sustainable dividends and also grow their dividends over time. Um, but there are also some other um, some other ways in there you can you can um, make gains. And I want to make a mention of alternative ass investments, alternative assets, um, which have become more important over the years, um, just because of the diversification benefits that they provide versus the other assets in the portfolio. And that by diversification, uh, what we're looking for is for 
assets that when you know things go horribly um, as they did you know in the couple of months this year um, these assets tend to not perform in the same way as the market so if the market is going down um, these assets either you know usually uh, stay um, very level or they don't go down as much and um, but on the other end if the equities and the other assets go up alternative investments can um, sometimes perform perform um, in the other way but that diversification benefit is important because that kind of sets this tone of your investment experience and uh, for most people you don't want you know too many highs or too many lows I should say that's usually what we're uh, we're really focused on you know you don't want to lose too much money um, and that and you give up a little bit of the you know extraordinary gains you might get on the other side to, to kind of put you in the middle of where uh, things might go So all of these components are used um, in some proportion uh, to create your investment portfolio. And later we'll, we'll go through, you know, what is done, you know, what, uh, what things are looked at, what um, components are needed um, from your, from your um, personal situation um, to kind of determine what's the best portfolio for you. So as you mentioned before, you have stocks, we have bonds and we have cash. You know, we go from stocks which have a high potential for return, um, also with the high potential fluctuations or, or uh, volatility, and obviously no return guarantee of, of uh, return of capital that we've seen, as we've seen with some stocks um, over the years that were once high flyers and now are worthless. Um, and then you have bonds kind of in the middle, um, which are, you know, they have lower to moderate return potential. Um, and because of that, they have lower to moderate fluctuations or volatility. And depending on the type of fixed income that you invest in, um, you know, you have a higher probability of return of capital, and then you have your cash. So all of this, um, especially the stocks and the bonds, all of this is to try to mitigate the impact of inflation, because inflation erodes the value of investment, it erodes the value of your cash over time. And I'm sure many of you, you know, you know, we, we kind of see it as uh, the dollar we had, you know, back in the 80s and 90s doesn't stretch as far as it does now. All of that is because of inflation. And that's why it's important to build a portfolio that balances the potential for returns versus, you know, the potential for loss and uh, your ability to handle loss or risk um, because you're trying to make sure that the value of your money um, is there for you, you know, when you actually need it. Um, you know, more often than not, if you stick all into cash, um, for example, uh, that value of cash just because of inflation will not be what you thought it was uh, when you go to retire. So no conversation about, uh, you know, kind of thinking about returns and portfolios. Um, you, you have to have a conversation as well about risk. Okay, so uh, a key part of mitigating risk um, is diversification, as I mentioned before. Now, the reason why we diversify is because um, it's very difficult to kind of decide or figure out which part of a particular, you know, market or which sector of market is going to do well in any one year. Um, if we all had the ability to, you know, see the future, um, we'd all be very rich and, you know, most of us aren't. So to mitigate that, most of us need to invest in some kind of portfolio that, uh, that is diversified enough that, you know, you take, you're going to take advantage of times when the markets are going up. And also you are not participating as much when markets are going down. And this is, so if you look at this chart here, for example, in each of the uh, 10 years that are illustrated here, there was a different section of the market that did the best for that year. So in some years, US equities did really well. Um, in other years, emerging market equities did well. Uh, US is also Canadian equities, you know, you're a Canadian firm. But uh, what I want to highlight is a balanced portfolio here in blue. So a balanced portfolio would be something like, you know, 55 to 60% in uh, equities and, you know, 45 to 30% in, uh, or 40% in, um, in bonds. So you see by combining the two kind of different behaviors of asset classes, you have a more, uh, you know, a steadier performance over time using history as a guide. 
um, you know, this doesn't mean that it'll always be this way going forward. There are always going to be bouts of, of volatility when uh, things, you know, seem to go bad. But uh, over time, history has shown that um, if diversified and especially balanced portfolio, depending on, on, on your uh, investment profile, works for, for the vast majority of investors. Because you can see here, for the most part, they're kind of in the middle here. Even in 2018, which was a down year for most equities, uh, we had a you know relatively down year, but not a majorly down year. Uh, a note about risk as well. So for some persons, um, you know, I've heard in the community, um, just speaking to people, that uh, some persons feel like you know my pension. Um, my pension company or the investment managers aren't really making the returns that I need. Um, why, you know, why not invest more in equities? Equities have done so well over the last, you know, five, 10 years, at least before February or March. Um, why is there so much fixed income? Um, it's barely growing. How am I going to have anything in retirement? Um, so one thing to bear in mind is when it comes back to that concept of risk, is because is, uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's a well-worn cliche that is used, um, especially in investing. Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And this is especially true um, when it comes to investing. So if you're a rational person um, or a rational investor, you, uh, for a level of risk that you're willing to take or for a level of funds that you're willing to give to someone to invest in your behalf, um, depending on the level of risk you're going to take, you expect a level of return. All right. So um, if you are investing, for example, in a company that has a major track record, a, ma a major long track record of, you know, doing, you know, good business, you know, making good profits, uh, keep managing their financial assets responsibly, uh, then you expect the level of return you expect from, from that company Will be different from another company say that doesn't have as much of a track record has never made profits um, is in the early stages of taking advantage of a you know particular um, opportunity in in an industry um, but they're but looking ahead the runway or the potential for growth going forward looks to be massive uh, that being said um, the the chances of failure on the other end are actually higher or would be higher for, for that company versus another, the other company, which would be, uh, which was more established than um, on a kind of a more even, even track. So uh, you would expect more returns from that second company, let's call it XYZ, um, the kind of early in the growth stages company, early in the industry company um, versus the first company, ABC, um, who is uh, more entrenched, you know, who is a major industry player in an industry that's been doing well for a long time and that has a good track record of earning good profits, good revenues, and managing their financial assets responsibly. Um, from the perspective of the company, uh, you would need to, so for ABC company, the one that's uh, entrenched and been around for a long time, you don't have to entice people to invest your money as much, to invest your money in you as much as um, XYZ would need to uh, because of its early stage. So, for example, let's look at it from a bond perspective. Um, you know, bonds pay uh, coupons or interest payments um, either once a year or twice a year. Um, ABC company could issue, could ask for people to lend money to them at a lower rate um, than would XYZ if they were trying to uh, raise money in that same way. Because you have to come as XYZ, who is early and doesn't have a great track record, but has a, you know, a good potential for the future, um, you, you have to kind of pay people to take the risk of you know, believing in your story, believing in your picture, believing in the opportunity. And you, you, have, to pay, you have to entice people by, uh, to, to, you have to entice people by paying you know, either higher interest rate on the, on the uh, funds you're, you're looking to borrow or, uh, or something like that. You, know, you kind of relate it to, to if you go to the bank um, to borrow, um, depending on what quality of credit um, you are determined to be by the bank, you get a you know a different interest rate. If you're if you're high quality credit, you get a lower interest rate. If you're a lower quality credit, you get a you have to pay a higher interest rate. 
So one other note on diversification is the experience over uh, longer time frames. So as you well know, if you pick um, any particular day in the stock market or any particular week, if you were to watch the financial news, there's always some crisis somewhere that either people think the market's going to go all the way to the moon or we're in the, we're in the midst of a crash and everything's going to, uh, to pieces. Um, that, you know, it, if you are someone who watches your investment portfolio day by day, um, that can be a real roller coaster ride. And I wanted to use this chart here to kind of um, illustrate the roller coaster ride of returns you can really have um, depending on the time period. So in, in, in one year, in a one year time period, you can see how massive the range of returns is for, for stocks um, using the S&P 500 index as uh, kind of your benchmark for stocks. In one year, um, in this period of returns, you had as low, in a one year period, you had as low a return of, as minus 43%. Um, that's almost half of your money. But you also had in, one, in a one year period, 61% gains. So imagine the emotional roller coaster you'd be on if you're watching your, your, um, your portfolio fall by almost half. But imagine the, uh, the elation you feel by your portfolio, you know, going up by more than half. Uh, that that's a real uh, that's a real uh, emotional ride for most people. Um, you see, with a balanced portfolio, it's kind of a better um, it's a better experience, but it's still pretty volatile. And as we mentioned before, bonds, which are less um, less volatile um, and more of a ballast, start kind of maintain their value more so than equities. Um, it's been a better ride, but um, still pretty high returns. So as you see here, as we enter longer periods of time, number one, the range of returns are actually lower that, that you see over a period of time. So let's say, you know, if you watch day to day versus if you were to turn off, you know, all financial news and stop looking at your investment portfolio for five years, uh, it would be much less of, a, of an emotional ride for you um, over a longer period of time to the point where even under 20 years, there actually isn't, a, in this time period, there isn't a 20 year period where either stocks, a balanced portfolio or bonds experiences a negative return period. And of course, history is no indicator of the future, but uh, you know, I'm gonna show you some other um, kind of examples of how over a longer period of time, you know, returns have generally, generally been positive, um, even in the midst of all the crises that we've been through. So one other kind of feeling that we get from talking to persons uh, about their you know, pension assets or about um, investing in general is why is it that we stay invested when things are going you know, horribly wrong? Why are we staying invested in 2008 or 2009 when the market thought, we thought the market was going to zero? Why didn't we get out of the market in, in uh, 2020, early February or March? And uh, we also thought things were going to zero because you know, every economy in the world basically was stopped. And um, our main theme and main answer to this is um, it's not about time in the market. It's about time in the market. So for someone who wants to be able to time the market, you have to get two things right. All right. You have to get your first decision you have to get right is when to get out. So when should I sell? Um, when should I sell my stock? So when should I uh, sell and go to cash? Um, and obviously, if you're trying to sell, you want to be able to sell at as close to the peak of the market as possible. Uh, to my mind, that's actually the pretty easy decision. Uh, most people are very, you know, they're, they're, they have no hesitation uh, to go ahead and say, um, I'm ready to get out. Let's go ahead and sell. The bigger problem, though, uh, is the second decision. When to get back in. So when do I make the decision? When do I pull the trigger? When do I actually go ahead and buy again? And that to our mind is actually the, the harder decision to make uh, because you, you really, to be successful at time in the market, you really want to put your cash back into the market as close to the lowest point as possible. Now on paper, that sounds really easy. And you know, what some other, you know, kind of persons do or, teachers do, they may look at, you know, past charts and say, uh, you know, I would have bought here, you know, look at how this thing, uh, it's, it's so obvious that this was going to go up, I should have bought here. Um, it's a lot easier to look at it on a chart historically, 
it's much harder to do uh, when you're actually watching the market um, seemingly head to zero. And in our experience with uh, dealing with clients over the years, uh, most investors get this wrong way too often and it's extremely costly to their results. And we have a couple of charts here to illustrate this point. So from our colleagues at Global Invest, RBC Global Investment Management um, over in Canada, uh, this chart shows uh, the, benef the, well, the benefits, the cost of missing periods in the market. So uh, the first, so let's look at uh, missing the best 10 days, for example, um, in a one year period. Uh, you know, these are, these are terrible results. So let's look at, if you stayed invested um, in a one year period, you actually made 22%. Um, and this is during, you know, you're staying invested, so you're experiencing the worst days, but you're also experiencing the best days. Um, what we found most times is what, what happens is when you, uh, when you make that decision to sell um, and you're, you're waiting and waiting for the opportunity to buy, you're missing the best days of the market and they just go by and that anxiety builds up and, and until at one point you just say, I got to get back in and usually it's at the wrong point. So by staying invested in a one year period, by staying invested and in going through the worst days, but also going through the best days, you're looking at 23% um, return. Uh, this is looking at the S&P TSX index over in Canada versus if you, um, you know, got out and you happen to miss the 10 days in a, in a one year period, uh, 11% returns. It's, uh, you can see over, over different time periods, um, how much, you know, the return difference, um, by not actually being in the market is substantial. And I want to show, um, a couple of other charts that will kind of drive this point home. So if you bear me one minute just to uh, change things here. So if you look at this chart, this puts um, historical um, performance of the stock market in context. So we're looking at one dollar invested in uh, 19, around 1970 and what that dollar would be worth um, in December 2019. So if you just take a, you know, kind of a bird's eye view, you know, this is a perfect chart left to right, uh, things are going up, you know, so $1 invested in 1970 turns into $153 and 91 cents at the end of December, 2019. Now, you know, I read a story recently about a person um, who uh, went to the hospital with pneumonia um, back in March, wasn't, you know, COVID, you know, was there, but it wasn't really, uh, you know, it wasn't front of mind. So he didn't know he had COVID. And he, uh, he was placed in a coma and he, uh, he stayed in that coma for two months, only coming out of the coma in, 20, in, um, in May of this year. And he basically had to be educated on what COVID is. <laughs> he had no idea what COVID was. Uh, imagine having to wake up in a world where, you know, as soon as he walks out of the hospital, why are people wearing masks? Why aren't there more people on the street? Uh, why is our city so empty? You know, okay, uh, that's kind of a good analogy for you know investment experience if you try to do day to day versus um, long term investing. So we can see here in this you know we're talking uh, almost fifty years of data, uh, how many crises and how many crashes we've had to live through. Some of them short. For example, the stock market crash in the nineteen eighties, in the late nineteen eighties. You know. We're looking at uh, you know forty percent or so, even fifty percent declines and eventual comebacks. Um, you know the dot com crash in the early two thousands, um, where things went pear shaped again, um, and then the most recent one, uh, or well for this chart anyway, for uh, what happened in the financial crisis, where a dollar turned to fifty cents. Um, you know we went through some very, very, um, very high volatility, very stressful, quite frankly, times, but. Uh, from a long-term perspective, if you fell asleep in, in 1970 and invested a dollar and woke up in, in December 2019, that dollar turns into $153.91. And to kind of put that in more perspective, if we look at instead of, ten, instead of a dollar, $10,000 um, invested and left alone um, from 1970 and left in the market till December 2019, that $10,000 turns into $1,539,100. This really shows the power of long-term investing and allowing 
those returns to accumulate over years, not reacting um, to different market crises, maintaining a diversified portfolio, um, because it's very difficult to try and pick, you know, what, what one company is going to do versus investing in a basket of companies in different industries. Um, you have more chances of everything kind of surviving as a rising tide lifts all boats in a, in a working economy. So I think that really puts it, puts it in perspective um, why longer term investing is so important. And then one more chart we wanted to share with you. Um, this kind of shows the opportunity cost of people who decide, you know, after, um, you know, a major volatility event in the market, I'm just going to go to cash and that's it. I can't, I can't take this anymore. Um, so this looks at the, the uh, financial crisis time frame. So you had 100,000 um, invested and, you know, at the, during, uh, between, you know, 2008, 2009, um, you had kind of three choices here. So the first choice is to decide you're either going to exit the market and stay in cash, which a lot of people did. Um, you have your second choice, which is I'm going to exit the market, but I'm going to get back in in a year, which, you know, some people do, but that's also a very difficult decision, especially during those, uh, during those volatile times. And then the third option is I'm just going to stay invested and, you know, let things go. So if you, so for choice one, for a person who went to cash and stayed in cash, that 100,000 at the beginning of uh, January uh, 2007, 2008, um, you, only left, you only left at the, uh, around January 2020, you're only left with $57,000 after 100,000 investment. You know, you kind of stuck with the loss. I can't, I can't be bothered with, with investing again. It's just too stressful. Um, that's a major opportunity cost. Even for someone who decided, I'm just going to wait it out a year and then get back in, the opportunity difference, cost difference between staying in the market and waiting that one year is still over $100,000 difference. And those numbers are, I mean, that's, that's for 100000 So if you can imagine someone, you know, with a million dollars or so to invest, those are kind of life-changing numbers um, that you have to think about, especially when you come into your retirement years and you're looking to have that nest egg turn into something that, you know, generates income for you during your retirement years, um, that can be especially, uh, that can be, that can make a big difference in, um, in what you, in what you have left. And, you know, it's kind of important too for this pension law because, um, you know, some persons may decide, you know, they're going to just take out a chunk and, um, and do without it. But you can see, you know, reducing that investment amount in the market, uh, can make a major, major difference in, in what you have available, uh, you know, when you do come to those retirement years. You know, we're, we have an average, we kind of have a, you know, average retirement age of 65. And based on current life expectancies, people are expected to live 20 to 30 years um, in retirement. So $100,000 not available to you in retirement can make a massive difference. Um, so just something to think about. So, so um, let's go back to retirement for a second. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, um, you know, we're usually in one of two camps when we're, uh, when we're talking about retirement. We're either looking forward to retirement with great anticipation or we're looking forward to retirement with great dread. Um, either one, we, you know, everything's in order, we have everything we need, or, you know, oh my gosh, um, how am I gonna survive uh, with this little bit in my pension pot? Um, so like I said, you know, the average retiree can expect to live 20 to 30 years um, beyond your additional traditional retirement age of 65. So how do you maintain your, your lifestyle in retirement? This is just a very important question because, you know, we spent all these years, you know, saving or, or you know, living a certain way, when, you know, whether we choose or are forced to retire, we want to maintain that lifestyle. We don't, we don't, none of us really wants to have a worse off lifestyle. You know, some people choose to, you know, do different things that live off the grid and, and such. But for most of us, uh, we want to actually, we want to either maintain or actually improve our lifestyle um, as we retire. What about, you know, as you get older, you're more likely to have some kind of sickness or health emergency. Um, how am I going to pay for that? What if I have to, you know, 
go into long-term care? What if I need emergency surgery? Uh, what am I going to do? Um, you know, for those of us who have children, what, you know, I want to help them with their education. Uh, I want to, you know, if they, you know, if they're older children and they start to have their own children, you know, you want to be able to help, you know, the grandchildren or the great grands uh, attend university, or you want to give them gifts, or you want to spoil them. You know, what what about that? And then, um, what about, you know, I want to give to a great cause that I that I uh, that I like, that I've been supporting all this time. Um, you know, how does that factor into to that retirement pot? And that's where um, an investment portfolio um, plays a really key role in, um, in allowing you or helping you to reach those goals. So um, I think one of the biggest keys to having um, a good investment um, experience is to have an investment plan. Uh, it's absolutely key um, in avoiding many of the pitfalls that we just discussed before. Um, if you have a plan and you have a plan that's, you know, continues to be up to date, um, that, that factors in your current circumstances, um, your situation, um, then you know what you need to do when things arise. All right. So that's why we say have a plan, which is great, but also stick to the plan. Um, so that's where working with an investment advisor comes in really handy because an investment advisor um, is really able to ask you the key questions um, that help you understand um, your um, situation and help you think about your situation in a way that maybe you didn't think about it before. So the major inputs for creating a good investment plan, um, first and foremost, your tolerance for risk uh, and your ability to take risk. Those are, when you're thinking about your investment experience, um, it's best not to look at it from a return perspective. How much money um, am I going to make? Um, it's really better to think about it in the sense of how much money am I willing to lose? Um, how much money can I lose? So how much money you're willing to lose is your, uh, is your tolerance and how much can I lose um, is your ability because inevitably there are going to be times when the markets go down. Um, there's going to be another crisis. Um, there's going to be another recession caused by something else that we, we can never even imagine what would be, what it would be. Um, and there are going to be times when your portfolio doesn't perform the way that you would like it to. Everybody likes to see the portfolio going up. We, we none of us likes to see losses. Uh, and that, that actually plays a key role in sticking to your plan. And that's where an investment advisor um, comes in because an investment advisor can, you know, sit you down and remind you of uh, this is the plan that we have. We, we planned for, you know, bouts of volatility like these. Um, that's why we have a portfolio design in this way. Um, you know, you ask key questions like, have your situation, has your situation changed? You know, are there, is there a new, um, is there a new pitfall that we have to think about? You know, have you lost your job? Um, is there a new child um, that you have to take care of? Um, is there a health emergency that we, that wasn't there before? All of that plays um, a key, all of those factors play a key role in creating an investment plan that will work for you. Um, so, you know, leading out of that important time frames and milestones, you know, I want to, you know, make sure my child is ready for college in 20 years. I want to have that funded, you know, over time. I don't want to fix loans or whatever. Um, you know, I'm looking to retire in 20 years, 30 years. Um, I want to, you know, buy that, you know, buy that yacht that I want to buy that, that nice car that I've had my mindset on for so many years. I want to be able to save towards that over time. Um, all of that, all of those um, time frames, milestones, um, goals uh, play a key part. Um, in creating an investment plan and maintaining an investment plan that works for you. And you should really think about your investment plan as a kind of a living and breathing document that is gonna change, that's gonna be updated as your circumstances change. Um, your investment needs at you know, 20, 30 years old is gonna be different um, from your investment needs at, uh, in 40, 50, at 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, so, you know, investment plans have to change as time, as time goes by, as your life situation changes. Um, I see we have a raised hand. I don't know if, uh, maybe we take that question now or, uh, do we, do we just keep going? Let's just keep going, um, Paul, and then we can get questions at the end. Thanks. Okay. No problem. So to speak more about investment plans and, uh, and planning in general, 
I'm going to invite my colleague uh, Gordon Goss um, to, to uh, provide some insights. As mentioned, he's a certified financial planner, and he's, uh, he's been uh, doing this kind of thing for, for a few years. Um, so he's a really good person to talk to about kind of how to think about planning for the future. And I'll hand it over to Gordon. Hi, everyone, and thank you for your time today. Uh, Paul made me look a little bit bad by wearing a tie and a, and a jacket. But, uh, you know, I, th I thought we were looking at more of a casual Friday type situation here from our from our homes. Um, yeah, so Paul touched on a lot of incredibly important aspects of the the overall uh, investment planning scenario and setting realistic expectations for rates of return, you know, upside and, and downside issues that you might encounter. Uh, sort of my role here in this presentation is to, to marry the investment aspects to what is most important in, you know, the individual, the client, everyone on this call's lives. And, you know, the, the investment component is is a vehicle to deliver you in the end to your destination and one of the things that i find always works extremely well for clients is um you know sort sort of bucketing your money and and as far as a bucket strategy goes you you can have your your short-term liquid kind of near-term goals, your, your three to six month emergency fund, um, your medium term goals, whether it's, you know, paying for a, a kid's education here in, in the wonderful Cayman Islands. I know all of us parents are, are fortunate to pay uh, fairly significant education costs on an annual basis. So, uh, you know, that, that's almost more of a short term need. But whether you want your kids to go away to school in the UK or the US or, or Canada or wherever for their post-secondary endeavors, um, it's always something to kind of get a plan behind. And then from a longer term perspective, uh, obviously our, our own retirement, at, at some point we are hopefully going to make the choice on our own accord to not go to work on a daily basis and to spend our time in the way that we desire to uh, from when we get up in the morning to when we go to bed at night. And, you know, the, the importance of planning for that end objective and retirement is, is critical. So as, as important as the investment plan is, we also want to know what we're planning for. Uh, an important aspect of retirement is not what we are retiring from, but rather what we are retiring to. So that's that's another another important discussion point that you can have with an investment advisor like myself or Paul, and the, you know, there's a few others in our office. Um, uh, one thing that that Alex touched on, as well as Paul touched on, is you know, we are extremely uh, psychologically and emotionally tied to the well-being of our financial universe. Um, you know, same thing with this, this pension collapse kind of, some of us are using it as an additional safety net to pay for the emergency day-to-day -day expenses. Um, and some people are using it for additional flexibility so so they can you know take take the reins in their in their financial affairs and you know as a firm that's that's where we would come in so you know, throughout throughout my career and i've I've delivered hundreds of financial plans to individuals in in Canada. You know, it, it was it was more of a tax planning scenario, and here in Cayman, as we know, it's it's more of a lifestyle planning scenario. You know, we we have enhanced costs around a few things in retirement, like for for example, healthcare being one of them. You know, on on some items, our cost of living is a little bit higher, but at the same time, we're fortunate to not have 
direct taxation on our income, so we should have uh, you know greater resources to fully fund our retirement objectives. And uh, the earlier you, you start planning for these type of things, the the more fruitful the the end the end objectives will look. So I think um, you know when you when you sit down and and have a lengthy discussion and speak to your spouse about what your long term objectives might be, speak to the investment professional that you're working with around how to fund these objectives, you know, start to create a, a retirement budget based on your, your current needs. Maybe you want to, you know, spend summer somewhere where it isn't uh, quite, quite as high of a perspiration environment as we have here in Cayman. Maybe that's only happens to me exclusively being a, uh, a, a Canadian that's still still adjusting to the the climate and you know rigorously applying sunscreen on a daily basis um, so so you know what I would highlight is basically along the lines of what what Paul was saying about time in versus not timing the market and then the the in extremely important uh, aspect of of marrying your investment plan to why you endeavored to accumulate the financial capital and resources in the first place. You know, some some people, further to Paul's point, are are extremely um, focused on providing for the next generation and some people you know like my parents are extremely focused on spending every last cent that they ever accumulated for their own benefit right so so you know every situation is unique similar to every investment plan being unique and every financial plan which is tied to that investment plan being unique and where we can go is sort of you know, we we have to marry all these multifaceted aspects of of the individual's life with one another, and and make sure that it it creates a a cohesive mix going forward, and provides the individual with uh, enhanced peace of mind for their retirement, which you know in in today's day and age can be extremely lengthy. You know, there there are many many folks around these days that live past their hundredth birthday, so uh, you know we need to to make sure that that's peaceful. One thing we can also plan around is sort of uh, like layering cash flows in retirement. You know, your first ten years you're gonna be more active, you're gonna travel more, you're gonna do more things with your grandkids. Sort of the you know if we call it a thirty year retirement, just for the benchmark scenario in this in this situation. The middle 10 years you're 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 still well but you know maybe you don't like spending time in airports so you're not traveling too much you're sticking around closer to home and then the last 10 years you want to kind of plan for you know the unfortunate reality that you might have enhanced medical expenses that you don't want to be a burden on your family and you know potentially also you'll you'll want to have all the financial aspects of your life well ironed out in advance. So I think, um, you know, overall we've, we've taken an, taken an hour of your, your time here. And I'm sure that some people have some pressing questions they might want to ask around the financial planning, investment planning, investment management process. I uh, am, a, am a firm believer that, um, you know, we, we offer great solutions here in the Cayman Islands, as uh, Alex so passionately alluded to in her uh, introduction of us. And, um, you know, ho hopefully we, we've provided some insights that are, are helpful along the way of, of your individual journey and um can provide some some peace of mind on a 
going forward basis on some some things that that you and your family might might want to iron out from a investment management and planning standpoint so i guess we'll open it up to questions now paul yep we are just about at the end here thanks again gord and uh don't worry i think your your acclimation to our climate's gonna is gonna is gonna it's gonna happen don't worry <laughs> <laughs> So let's, uh, let's start with Catherine. She has her hand up, so I'll ask her to unmute. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks, first of all, for hosting this. It's been very in informative so far. My question is, um, as you all have already alluded to, there are going to be people who have had their um did apply for the, the pension payout, they've gotten their funds, but they're not ready to use it yet. So for instance, there may be someone who took that money out in order to pay for a down payment on their home like a, that they plan to construct, but they're not ready to construct that home yet. They may have like a year, a year before they're ready to break ground. What in your, what would be the best investment um, vehicle to use for short-term returns. Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, so, you know, if you're, so for someone in that situation, they're focused on, um, I'm assuming, preserving that cash balance as much as possible um, with, uh, you know, the opportunity to maybe earn some income on that um, because you want as much of that, you know, portion of funds to be ready when you are ready to go ahead or you want it to be as, as available uh, when you are ready to go ahead um, with the purchase of, of your home and using that to finance it. Um, so generally speaking for situations like that, what we usually recommend are um, very short term, very liquid and uh, very, you know, relatively safe um, short term, you know, bonds or fixed income like uh, money market securities or like uh, treasury bills in a, you know, in a well-established, you know, country or well-established, uh, well-established, you know, financial institution, such as, you know, like the U.S. government, for example, you know, they're kind of deemed as the kind of the safest, uh, the safest, um, you know, investment vehicles of that type. Um, so generally speaking, um, you want to keep it as something that's short term. You want to keep it in something that, um, you know, provides you with some, um, some ability to earn a little bit of income, but more importantly, you want it to be ready and available, um, you know, when the time comes. Um, you know, one note to add to that would be, you know, with the kind of reaction that the different um, central banks around the, around the world have, uh, have done and the steps they've taken to mitigate the effects of the, the economic effects of uh, COVID-19 um, is that uh, they have lowered, you know, interest rates, uh, you know, to either zero or near zero or, or even below zero in, in some other uh, jurisdictions. So for people who are looking to invest, that's fantastic. Um, for savers, um, that's not as good. So the interest rates available for, um, for you know, shorter term, uh, shorter term instruments like money markets, like US Treasury bills are now quite low. So going back to Gore's point about setting expectations, it's important to understand, um, you know, what you can expect um, given the time frame you're looking to invest in and what you're looking to invest in. So I hope that answers your question. And if Gord has anything to add there as well. Sorry about that. It took me a minute to unmute. Uh, no, I, I agree with Paul. Like just uh, something that's, that's liquid and secure is where you would want to put uh, down payment for for a home you know obvi obviously each each individual is different and some individuals will will view risk different than others but uh to paul's point the the investment management textbook says if the client has a finite short period of time where they need a fixed amount of funds then uh, we propose products without risk. Let's talk a little bit about the pension withdrawals that are coming up now. Um, you now, obviously, the, some of the money will start flow, flowing into the 
to, in different pensioners hands probably next week and you know there'll be a, a bit of a, a a big sigh of relief for many um, but for those say people that um, are working and maybe you know they they decide yeah we'll we'll take some of that money out um, and they take out the ten thousand dollars tell us what you think they should do with that money if they don't need to have access to it right away so i mean put sitting in a bank account you've shown to us over the long term not going to earn too much interest so what would you recommend with say a ten thousand dollars that is is in a bank account right now where would you put it in terms of investments I would, you know, we, again, depending on, um, you know, the individual circumstances of, of each person, um, we've shown clearly that there's a, there's a big disadvantage to kind of keeping that money out of the market working for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's in the, if it's in your bank account and, uh, it, you know, it's not earning, you know, interest, it's not, you know, earning dividends from, from equities, it's not um, in the running for potential growth, from um, equities going um, going back up as economies improve um, and, and other different factors. Uh, it's costly um, if the funds aren't needed um, to be spent and they're not needed, you know, for day-to-day -day survival, day-to-day -day living. It's costly to just have it sitting in the bank. It, um, the longer the funds are working for you in the um, in the stock market or in the or or the fixed income market, um, all things being equal, um, and history being a guide. Um, the better chance you have of those funds um, maximizing, maximizing the benefit of those funds um, to, you know, to achieve your future goals. And what type of products does RBC have in terms of that? Do you have certain um, funds that you guys um, have created in equities and bonds and and it's a, a kind of a, a fund that you would invest in and how do you go about doing that? So we have quite a wide range of ways to get invested and I'll let Gord as well, um, I'm chiming here, um, just to give a general idea. Um, so, you know, we have access to exchange traded funds, um, which have become kind of a, a really important tool for, for a lot of people as a way to get into the market at a, at a you know, kind of a cheaper rate. Um, for folks who have a little bit more, who have more to invest, um, we have, you know, what we call actively managed, uh, you know, uh, funds or we, we designate managers, investment managers that have more of an active um, role in kind of picking investments um, that they think will do better over the long term. Um, we also design, we, we really focus on designing portfolios, taking those different tools such as the equity portion, the fixed income portion, and, uh, you know, cash portion to design a portfolio that will assist people in reaching their goals. Um, and there are different tools within the equity, such as ETF, such as buying you know, individual stocks um, or buying um, individual bonds from different companies um, that we combine to, to make sure we have the best chance um, to achieve client's goals versus um, taking as least risk as, risk as possible. And I'll turn over to Gord as well, just to, to add a little bit there. Yeah, I think, you know, Paul, Paul addressed that well. Um, the, the difficult part is it's not really like a one size fits all program. So, you know, you, with, with any financial professional, when they're asked a, a direct question without knowing the client's entire fact pattern in front of them, your, your answer should be in most instances, that depends and you know we should we should respond with a question to gain a better knowledge of what's important to the individual you know for example i have uh, a, a number of clients who are um australian and at the at the end of their career here in cayman would think of uh going back to australia to retire so we can use our multi-currency platform, uh, take advantage of buying Aussie dollars when the currency is low and, you know, look, looking at their market on an opportunistic basis. You know, the same goes for individuals from the UK, Canada, what have you. So, so it, it is really difficult to do a, a one size fits all kind of recommendation. 
And as far as our platform goes, we have access to, to literally every, every product in every developed currency and every developed market worldwide. I mean, that being said, just from a time zone standpoint, uh, for people looking for actively managed portfolios, we are by far um, most effective in North America, but we can uh, build in complementary kind of, you know, self-governing aspects of client portfolios wherever, wherever they think that their end destination might be in the world. Uh, Cayman has a, a very unique uh, group of individuals living and working here and many of which are are um, you know not not necessarily going to spend their entire life and career here just just to uh, lay out the disclaimer I, I hope that I will spend the rest of my life and career here uh, you know e everything everything being granted and with the the um, hopefully uh, favorable work permit renewals on a, on a biannual basis. But uh, yeah, so, so we are in a, we're in a position where, you know, we, we can do almost everything, but uh, again, it depends on the individual's circumstances. So is there anybody else who uh, want to raise your hand for questions uh, of our panel so that um, I, don't, I know everybody's busy, but if you have any burning questions, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll just add as well here, Will, that um, our contact details are also in the, um, in the presentation. So, you know, if, if anyone wants to kind of email one of us or all of us um, to ask questions more privately, um, we're happy to take those um, or our telephone numbers as well. Um, where you can find us on LinkedIn, um, or also, you know, available for people who want to contact us through that way. All right. Well, I'll also, is there, is there, if I may uh, also add as well, Will. Um, so this was all kind of, uh, you know, spawned out of an initiative we took to write. We wanted to really, you know, get people thinking about um, their pension funds in this way. Um, and we produced a recent uh, newsletter, um, Investing in Your Retirement. Um, that was just launched on LinkedIn as well. And I believe um, we did send a copy as well through the Chamber of Commerce, um, which kind of goes through some of the things we've spoken about here. Um, and, uh, you know, some things to think about for those funds that uh, may that may not, you know, go towards either, you know, surviving day to day or making that dream purchase. Um, so feel free to, uh, to hit us, either hit us up for a copy or I believe the Chamber might, uh, might be able to make a copy available. And it's also on LinkedIn. Well, excellent. Well, again, I'd like to thank, um, certainly like to thank you, Paul, Alexandra, and Gordon for an excellent presentation. Um, again, I, I encourage people who um, are getting some of the pension withdrawals to carefully consider how they manage those withdrawals. And uh, for those people who are still employed, um, you know, determine whether a pension withdrawal is your best interest or whether keeping the money in your pension plan for the long term can actually benefit you more than the short term in taking out the money. So, so again, I'd like to thank RBC for an excellent presentation and I hope everyone has a, a good weekend and those fathers out there, happy Father's Day to everybody. And I hope everyone enjoys the weekend. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, happy Father's Day. <laughs>